Feeling the need for change is at the heart of your ability to make it happen. Welcome to Turning Inward. I'm Vivian Carrasco, your midwife, teacher, and host for this podcast. Together, you and I are going to navigate the interior life. And we're going to do that by unearthing our personal truths, our own insight, and our inner knowing. These are weekly teachings that are brought to you by hard-nosed scientific evidence focused on spiritual direction with integrity and self-awareness. In two words, this is your inner work. Hello, Kim. <laughs> Hi, we, Vivian. We are, I am excited that we connected. I am interested about your story. Yes. <laughs> Where would you like to begin? Well, um, I often find that the questions that I get asked are, how do I start or where do I begin? So tell us um, that moment that you felt that shifting or for a lot of the, um, the individuals I have conversations with, with, they often feel something in their gut or some form of like some feeling that they just can't touch. Is that what yeah. happened with you? I think that's a good way of describing it. And as, as, as context, maybe I'll start by saying right now I teach meditation and I do private coaching and I teach workshops in companies and I lead retreats. I used to be a lawyer and I worked in this very large publishing company um, that created content for other lawyers. So at, at one point, you know, I was working in corporate and leading this team and was in charge of this multi-million dollar portfolio of content. And for me, you know, my transition was not um, necessarily so dramatic. Um, being a person who is a bit risk averse and likes to kind of feel through things before making a commitment, um, I've been accused of being shy of commitment so, <laughs> so for, for me really like like part of this whole transition happened very under the surface very quietly very gently for many years and and really what that means is while I was showing up to my nine to five I was exploring all these other things that were interesting me interesting me along the side so I you know had been studying dance and I was taking a lot of yoga classes and um, this one particular movement format, um, I decided to become an instructor in. And so I first, you know, became this aerobics instructor on the side. And I was teaching one class a week on the weekends because I loved it. And that was what got me really in front of teaching to a live audience and learning how to improv and deal with, deal with a crowd. And then as I was learning about that, I was curious about how the body worked and how the mind and body worked together. So I began sort of gently studying all these other things that were interesting to me, um, not even necessarily with the intention of I need to change my career in a dramatic way, but just like as a human who is interested in a lot of things, there were things that were curious to me. And, and so I started to explore them. So I think that you know, my advice, especially if it's hard to really pinpoint, you know, something needs to change, but what is that? You know, and you're sort of trying to listen to like, what is this voice drawing me toward? It can, it can be really hard to articulate what that is, because it's also possible that the thing you are moving towards, you don't actually know yet what that looks like or what it's called. But if you can listen to the little nudges and the little elements and be curious and say, oh, well, how would I taste something in that direction? How, what, what is interesting to me right now? And how can I learn and grow and meet people in that space without the pressure of this has to be something? That is a beautiful way to move in the world. And that is a beautiful way to start building both your network to start building your um, skill base, to start building your knowledge set around kind of what else is out there and to do it in a really gentle, easy way. In a very joyous way. It doesn't have to be a trail of tears. If you yeah. do it that way, it sounds like fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to, to also include, I mean, I didn't, I didn't hate my job. I mm -hmm. didn't have a soul sucking job. My job was fine. 
the steps that led me to a place where I decided it's time to really, uh, you know, make a big shift and change from corporate into something that is more like entrepreneurship and healing and art and, and something that is, is very different. You know, it was a series of steps um, that involved a lot of loss. Um, you know, it was my aunt dying of cancer. It was my stepdad getting a cancer diagnosis. It was my brother being hit by a car and visiting him in the hospital and, and just being with him as he was healing and learning how to walk again. Um, it was all of these kinds of moments that really point to the mortality and the temporariness of life. And because life is so um, short and you don't know how much you get, then it becomes suddenly very important that when I'm showing up every day to this to this work, um, I began to ask, you know, like like why like why am I coming here? Why am I showing up to this job that doesn't feel meaningful to me anymore? Um, maybe it did when I first started, but now I want something new. And it took me a while to be comfortable being okay wanting something new, and then deciding what might that look like. And eventually I reached this place where I thought, you know, and I did a lot of self-reflection. I did a lot of listening. I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of, you know, trying to understand just because I want something new. Like, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? How comfortable am I with, with stepping into the unknown? Mm -hmm. Um, if you had so, to look at it from a timeline perspective, because I, my journey is also years and years and years long, but I often find that folks are impatient. They want something to happen now, or they want some form of clarity now. And um, that's why I love having these conversations, because more often than not, it's a very long, slow process. And, and I love how you how you've described it as gentle and just sort of following your curiosity, following your hunches. Um, how what what is the time frame that you would say from start to where you felt settled? And this is what I am doing now. This is what I want and creating it. I will I will say it's always ongoing. But but honestly, from the moment when I had this clarity of something needs to change, it's no longer okay to be showing up for this job anymore. And I need to change that to when I actually resigned. It was less than six months. It mm. was, it was like February, um, February between February and late August. So maybe it may be about six months. Um, and in that time, you know, at, at first I thought the answer was, well, I'll just find a different job. And I was interviewing and I was, you know, looking to, to transfer to another company and that wasn't working. And then the intensity and that sense of urgency and that sense of, you know, this inner voice that said, Kim, do you really need to have everything perfectly lined up before you leave? Or is this important enough that you're willing to leave with a few things unknown? And, and for me, you know, and part of my reality, too, is that you know, I am single. I have a roommate in San Francisco, which helps a lot on my overhead, right? I had some money saved. I had been teaching a bit on the side. So in terms of my personal risk assessment, um, like I was able to make a choice that had I been married or had I had kids or had I had others depending on me, my choice path would have had to look different. Um, but because of where I was at, when those, when those sharp questions landed, I was able to to make those changes in that particular time frame. Interesting. Now you said that it was it took you a long time to be okay with wanting something new. Say yeah. more. Ooh, so I became a lawyer, right? Which is three years of school, so much money, <laughs> so much money. And and you and, and I worked so hard and I was so proud that I had I'd finished law school and I had passed the bar and I was, I had my bar number. I was a lawyer. Like I felt proud about that. Mm -hmm. I worked hard. I worked hard to, to accomplish that. And, you know, at the, at, and, and then, I mean, I, I, my first pivot was deciding not to practice law, but to work within um, the publishing industry adjacent to the legal profession. So I still was using my law degree and it was still important for me to understand the legal profession, though I wasn't practicing law, but I had so much invested in, in being in and around the legal profession. Mm -hmm. I had so much invested in my identity. I, I had so much invested in, in feeling like 
if I choose something new, does that mean I just wasted all that time and all that money? You know, am I throwing away a career that, you know, that essentially took me a decade to build? Um, Does that mean that I failed? Does that mean that I'm a loser? Does that mean that I didn't try hard enough? Like, like, what does it mean for me to want something new? Right. And it was a scary question because it was a lot I had put into to, to gaining that that position at the time when I was in that that corporate role, right, through law school and mm-hmm. through building my way up into this company. Um, and it was scary, right? Because if I, you know, go to a party and people say, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a lawyer and I work for the, like the second largest publishing company <laughs> in the U.S. Mm-hmm. That, that also carries some weight, right? That carries some status, that carries, um, you know, something in the world. And so to allow myself to want something new, something different, that felt threatening to me, right? That felt scary. Mm-hmm. Like, well, then who am I? And what, what will people think? What will my parents think? They're so proud of me, right? Like, what if I want something new? Is that, is that allowed? Um, and one of the things that really helped me with that was, was this, this thought, you know, it's kind of like, like you know, like the, the inner voice that says, you know, well, you know, Kim, what if life is really like an amusement park and you've been on this one ride for like 10 years, right? And you're really good at this ride and you know how it works and you're like, you're, you're doing a great job at it. But what if it's okay to want to explore other rides in the park? Like, what if it's okay to say, this has been great and now I want to try something new? Like, that would be okay. In fact, it would be sad if you only did one thing, if you were really curious about other things. So that mindset shift created just this huge sense of relief of, yeah, like it's okay to want something new. It's okay to update your dream. It's okay to have a goal, reach it, and then decide, you know what? Not what I want anymore. <laughs> not what I and thought not, it would yes, be. Yes, and not making it wrong, not making it a failure, but saying now that is done. Like the end of a chapter in a book. Absolutely. Interesting. That's beautiful. Now describe to me the difference, um, you know, because it, so imagine yourself at that cocktail party and you're no longer saying you're a lawyer at the largest um, publishing house in, in the United States. Now, what kind of significance and meaning do you have when you say you're a meditation teacher? It's interesting because it's taken me a long time to figure out how do I answer that question, Mm -hmm. right? Because I've been a fitness instructor. I've been a Reiki practitioner. I've been a, I've been a writer that like, these are all different parts of what I do, both like what the work is, but also what people pay me for. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so trying to sort my way through that and what has really been feeling good and true lately is really just saying, yeah, like I, I'm a meditation teacher that's the core of my work. That's the core of my coaching and of my workshops. And when I write my books, it's from this very meditative, observant place. So what's been really cool is I find that when I say to people, I'm a meditation teacher, number one, I don't really look like a meditation teacher. <laughs> I, I just look like a normal, <laughs> like a normal girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's, that kind of gets people curious Um, And the other thing that's been happening is more and more people have been brushing up against meditation at some point in their life, whether through an app or yoga or a retreat or a book they read. So people are curious and it kind of invites their curiosity and they usually say, oh, that's interesting. Like I've meditated before or, oh, I've been wanting to learn how or, oh, like how did that happen or Oh, why are you here? (laughs) Like you're the only meditation teacher at this, you know, event for entrepreneurs and startups and, or, or lawyers, like, like what's your connection to the space? Mm -hmm. So what's been neat is, you know, like people can be kind of intimidated or maybe impressed or have an opinion about lawyers, right? People very often do, but what's been neat is that by saying, Oh, actually I, I teach meditation. Um, it opens people's curiosity and it often opens people's personal stories about what, what their life is all about and, and their own journey around self-reflection, right? So that's what I've been finding lately. 
and, and it's and it's interesting because the, the the path that you described is the same, and you're describing the conversations that you engage in in the same way, sort of a playful curiosity, and that's beautiful. I absolutely love that the science is sort of picking up and delivering the evidence that um, that gives meditation that sort of that sort of weight. You know, I, you know, through the fitness industry, like I was everything from leg warmers to step aerobics, you know, I sort of tried everything as it came <laughs> up um, yeah. because then, you know, with fitness, it's like, that's okay to try. Um, but I love how meditation is, is sort of, um, I'm thinking of rain, you know, it's just starting to, we're, we're starting to be exposed to it at different levels and, and try all the different forms of it, just like the different forms of yoga. You know, it's not asanas. It's, you know, there's thousands of types of practices. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite, um, or do you have a um, sort of a core meditative practice that you prefer and that you teach? Um, I would say the, the core foundation is one of curiosity and kindness. Mm -hmm. And it's very much a mindfulness-based practice. So whenever I'm teaching, um, and this is especially help, like very useful when I'm teaching in corporate settings because the workplace is a busy, loud place. You know, we're in the city. There are sirens and jackhammers and horns honking. There's all this noise. And so to be able to lead a class in the midst of all this noise, and part of that teaching is, you know, when we close our eyes, you're going to hear all these sounds outside. And that's okay. That's actually not a problem. It's just something that's true in the moment. And using the natural external environment as a mindfulness practice um, is so powerful, right? Because we often think, oh, I'm going to meditate. I have to have a special quiet room. I have to have a special little bell. <laughs> like I have to have all these special quiet things. But it's actually most useful in the dynamic um, you know, flow and rise and fall of everyday life. So the practice is very much about being present to whatever is true in the moment and allowing it to be there without needing it to be different. And then the, the core within that is be curious and be kind with yourself and with everything that arises. And what I love about that is that it's, it's not a passive practice, it's an active practice, right? Like, what are you noticing? Choose to be curious, choose to be kind. And these are qualities that we're all born with. We all show up on the planet as these tiny, helpless little creatures that have this insatiable curiosity about the world around us, right? And have this kind of natural inherent, like kindness and joy as we move through the world. So I feel like so much of this practice is about reconnecting with that essential quality that we each have, but that gets buried or lost under the grit of every day. That's so very true. Well, and the way that you described it is, is also very practical. I, I see this trend, you know, of the sort of this new level of, of productivity and efficiency coming from this internal alignment, this, this, this efficiency of power versus force mm -hmm. And yes, yes. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> I have the biggest smile on my face right now. I'm like, That's it. <laughs> and, and the analogy I use most, and I absolutely love it because I, I've, I physically have experienced it is it's almost like the difference between walking into the ocean against the wave and getting to the location, tired, you know, salt in your mouth, you know, just exhausted and in, st or in, in, in presence with meditation and kindness and using the power that you're drawing from within, um, you're just sort of waiting for the next wave and you yeah. get there at the same time, but you're much less relaxed, you know, not as tired and you're just, it's, it's a more joyful experience. Yeah. And what I love about this uh, and exactly to your point is, you know, there are only so many hours in the day that part will never change. But the quality of your energy and attention, that can fluctuate a lot. And, and you have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of things to, um, you know, deepen and strengthen your attention or to raise and enhance your energy. And if you have an hour 
but you have terrible energy and terrible attention, you're not going to get that much done. If you have 15 minutes and your energy and attention are aligned and spot on, you're going to accomplish so much. So I love like exactly what you're saying, shifting the conversation around productivity from how many different ways can I parse and organize the little grid of time blocks on my calendar to Mm -hmm. pay attention to your energy and strengthen your attention because those are things you actually can influence and have control over. Yes. And I love the idea of more versus sort of abstaining or scarcity. Like you don't have to take a smaller slice. You make the pizza bigger. Yeah. The other thing I'm noticing, and, and I, I'm interested in your insights in the in the organizational setting, is that you know our technology nowadays is amazing. I mean, we take for granted that you're in San Francisco and I'm in Texas, and you know, triple digit heat. <laughs> <laughs> Sidebar there, <laughs> but we're having this intimate conversation that wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. So, so what I find happening is that the only way to sort of expand that potential is in, is in the relationship and the engagement in the humanness between one person and the other within and between each other, because the technology is giving us all it's got right now. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, technology is only ever a tool and the consciousness and the intention that we bring to that tool that's that's really the the critical piece, right? Yes, and we can't digitize humanness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I could feel your smile. <laughs> so, um uh, so th- and and that sort of leads me to it's probably a conversation that you have um very often this difference between management in the in the traditional sort of manufacturing way that we're used to and now this need and this call for for leadership in organizations mm-hmm. do you find that i do and i find that from a couple of angles i find it from both you know in san francisco we have a lot of companies that grow very quickly and so very often um, you have people that are moving into management roles very fast or they've never managed people before, but you know they're the most senior person, they understand the business, and they're very strong in, the, in their particular technical domain. But learning how to um, work with other humans mm-hmm. is, very, is like very challenging. And it's, and it's less, like this is my, my air quote, it's less managerial mm-hmm. in the sense of here's the process, here's the system, we're going to teach you how to work within it. Because you're creating everything as you go and nobody really knows because everyone's trying to, to figure it out at the same time. So there's a fluidity and a responsiveness that is required with the, the way that so many of these organizations are operating. And so this question of how do we empower people? How do we develop them as leaders? How do we do that um, at speed and at scale? Like, like what, is that, what does that look like? That's a question so many people are asking from the internal corporate side. But I think too, so many more employees, so many more people working in organizations are wanting to step into leadership of their own lives for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because our career trajectories have really different shapes now than they did even five years ago, right? Yes. So leadership is definitely something that's on, you know, everyone's mind on, on all sides of the picture. Yes, 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 yes. We're making choices just like the choice that you described and making those choices without the framework of security, right? I know if I follow this path, I will get to this end state is no longer there for us. Right. So Mm -hmm. so it's that. um, And it's probably the same thing with this, this, um, you know, scaling so fast and moving from a technical expertise to, to, you know, influencing um, and even leading, you know, your peers is this, this unknown. How do we, um, you know, sort of navigate through that, through the, through the chaos of, I don't even know what to call it. It's just this darkness, you know? Right. And just like everyday life. And, and part of what I like to remind people of is, is you are, you are a leader in the way that you show up to your life, right? Like from the moment you wake up in the morning, you are, 
um, you are being a leader in your life, right? So being a leader has nothing to do with your job title. It has nothing to do with your hierarchy within an organization. We've all been in jobs or in organizations where there was someone who was not officially a leader, but definitely held the reins of influence, right? <laughs> yes. And, and when I have conversations, I call that, um, you know, developing your response, mm. you know, space, ability, responsibility before you have authority. Because yeah. in the old days, right, we waited for that authority, that label, that, that bar number, you know, the mm -hmm. whatever certification or degree gave you the authority to have an opinion or make a decision. And now we're taking responsibility for those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be a little bit scary at times. Absolutely. Especially with so many moving parts and especially with so many things that are unknown. And I think that's where this idea of meet the moment as it arises, mm -hmm. handle it to the best of your ability, learn from the experience, and then, and then like, like lather, rinse, and repeat. Like it's this continual, like being in the present, addressing what's here, learning from it, and bringing that learning to this next unfolding moment. So it's both, you know, you see the forest, you see the trees, it's the inhale and the exhale, it's the strategic view and the tactical view. And being able to, to include both of those, that's like, that's the dance. And, and the image, the metaphor that came to mind is sort of having this sharp focus and then softening your gaze. Mm -hmm. You know, so so coming in and out so that you're you're both in the specific and then seeing everything around you. Now, I'm going to ask you this question because it's a question I very often get asked, and I'd love to, to hear your insight. I get asked, but how do I begin? Mm, you begin with what's closest at hand and with what is easy. So for you, that might, you know, like, like for, for whoever is listening, that might be um, going to a speaker or a meetup or, or, or like engaging with other humans close by, right? Something that is interesting to you, go learn about it. Um, a speaker that is interesting, go listen to them. A book that is interesting, go read it. A magazine that is interesting, go read it. Um, the library is a tremendous resource. And I love the library because all those books are for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And and the greatest too is you, you, you go with the book in mind and then you browse all the ones on the shelf beside it and you get to see other things that are related to it. So allow that curiosity to start moving you in a gentle way, right? And start to feed that curiosity and to learn and to grow and to try small things. And trying a small thing, if, if you know, like for me, trying a small thing was, well, um, I want I to, to start teaching, right? I didn't know ultimately I would be teaching meditation, but, but I knew I loved movement and fitness. And so I started trying to teach. To teach fitness. And the way I did that was I went to the Y, the YMCA and I said, Hey, like I just, you know, gained my certification in this one fitness class. I haven't taught before, but I want to <laughs> teach. Can we do that? And they said, yeah, like, here's how we onboard, you know, volunteer instructors. And so, so you find things that are easy and you find things that are close. You know, you, you, you set yourself up with as much sort of support and encouragement and energy as possible so that as you take these little steps, it, it starts to, you know, I'm getting now the image of, that, you, that you proposed of the ocean and the tide. Like you, you let the tide kind of carry and support you and contribute to that, that forward moving energy. I love that. I love that. And it, it brings to mind um, Parker Palmer's um, Let Your Life Speak. Um, and one of my favorite quotes, I, hope, I, I, I don't know how many times I say this, but um, there's a story that I heard about someone asking Mother Teresa, how do I help? Where do I make a difference the way you're making a difference? And Mother Teresa said, go home and love your family. It's like it starts right where we are right now. There's no, you know, sort of trip that has to happen or giving anything up. You just start to listen to your life. Yeah, I love that. So, Kim, I, if our listeners want to know all about you and how to reach you and where to find more of you, where do they go? 
Yep. So two places. I'm really active on Facebook. I write there a lot. So you can always find me on Facebook. Um, just under my name, look for Kim Nickel. You'll find me there. Or you can go to my website, which is kimnickel.com. And if you want my book, that's on Amazon. The book is Offering. Um, it's the mindfulness book, not the zombie book, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and that's where you can learn more and, and connect. Wonderful. And if you had one last piece of insight or wisdom to share with the world, what would it be? Um, it is this, that life is amazing. And so often we forget because we're looking into the gap of where we want to be or where we think that we should be. So definitely take time to appreciate and enjoy and to celebrate the wonder that is right in front of you right now. Beautiful, delightful. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you for having me, Vivian. If you want more help moving forward and breaking out of a negative mental pattern, I personally host an online community of practice for smart, successful women and a few super cool dudes that gives you more support, tailored training, and an unlimited professional coaching. Visit my digital home at viviancarasco.com to learn more.